Um, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, good evening, and uh, welcome to this thought-provoking session on antibiotic prophylaxis in urological interventions. Tonight, we will be diving into deep questions surrounding this critical topic of for who, when, and where. I'm Zafer Tandold, and I uh, have the privilege and honor of chairing this session. And before we dive into our session, I'd like to go through a few details in a couple of minutes. I'd firstly like to talk about antimicrobial resistance, a critical issue that looms over modern surgery. It's a global challenge, as, as you might, as you're here, you will be aware of this, that challenges the foundations of medical practice. It's not a surprise for me to tell you that antimicrobial resistant rates are high, but they're surging to alarming levels, eroding the effectiveness on of antibiotics. And to an extent that now we can see a rise in multidrug resistant pathogens spreading around the globe. And as you would have been experiencing, probably, I wish not, but it's hindering patient outcomes, amplifying healthcare costs and undermining our success in surgery. It almost feels like we're at a critical juncture at this time point, but we can't wait. We cannot afford to wait any longer for new antibiotics to arise, new vaccines or new technological uh, progress to save the day. Instead, we're at a position that we need to act rapidly, altering our behavior on how we use the existing antibiotic armamentarium and revolutionize the way we think. So we have the power to reverse the situation, we have the technology, we have the know-how, and we have the evidence. So by doing so, if we can achieve such things, we will be able to preserve these antibiotics for future generations. And that means that we, will be need, we need to employ antibiotic prophylaxis where necessary, and avoid misuse of antibiotic prophylaxis. Unfortunately, our studies have shown that in urology, there is misuse of antibiotics for simple procedures, starting from cystoscopies for diagnostic purposes, ranging all the way up to very complex surgical procedures. And we do need to ask the deep question of, how can we de-escalate the antibiotics we're using? We can't use them simply to override infection prevention measures. We can't use them to, for, um, without any control. So this evening's session is addressing this nuanced topic when it comes to antibiotic uh, prophylaxis, the principles, the challenges, but potential solutions at the same time. So as we navigate through this evening's discussion, I'll encourage all of us to reflect on our existing practice and how we can change things. And hopefully this, this evening's session with our esteemed speakers who have spared their time in their busy schedule will be of help shedding some light. First, we will start with Professor Florian Wagenlehner from Gießen, who will talk about the principles of deciding on antibiotic prophylaxis. This will be followed by Professor Frank Boyer from Tours in France, um, who will talk about, well, actually, he will go into a very difficult question. Can we even dare to ask the question, actually, on whereby radical surgeries can be conducted with less antibiotics? I'm sure there are some of you who do that, but we would like to hear from the experience that Frank has collated the data. We will be followed by Prof Bashkar Somani from Southampton, who's an outstanding endourologist and stone surgeon, talking about particularly antibiotic prophylaxis in stone surgery. This will be followed by Professor Truls Eric Bertland from Oslo, who will be going into quite exciting topic of what's in the pipeline of studies that we can register and recruit in terms of addressing the current issues. So as we approach to the end of the session, we will have a Q&A session where we'll have the pleasure of hearing your questions 
I'll be keeping track of these questions from the chat. If you if you pop them in there, I will then bring them to the floor for further discussion. I, without any further ado, I hope this evening's session will challenge our existing assumptions whereby we can broaden our horizon and hopefully see how we can change our practice. Without any further ado, I hand over to Professor Wagenlehner to give his speech. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Saver. Thank you for this introduction and thank you for inviting me to this EZU online program. Ladies and gentlemen, my topic will be to talk about the principles in deciding on antibiotic prophylaxis. So just to remind, antibiotic prophylaxis accounts for a significant account of antibiotics given in the hospitals. All over the hospitals is 15%. In surgical units, it's much more uh, where antibiotics are used for prophylaxis of, in our case, urological interventions. And um, if we need antibiotic prophylaxis, it's very important to prescribe it appropriately. And it will give you some insights on the basic principles. Of course, the target of the antibiotic prophylaxis is to prevent infections at the surgical site or where you're operating. It's not necessarily only skin infections. It can be also bacteremia or other infections. And antibiotic prophylaxis should always be differentiated from antibiotic therapy because usually antibiotic prophylaxis is only a single dose of antibiotic. Now, it should never substitute, however, for good medical practices. And we have a lot of principles apart from giving antibiotics to avoid infections. You know, hand hygiene, surgical practice is very important to have a diligent operation practice. Of course, instrument sterilization, but also optimization of risk factors such as diabetes mellitus, for example. And perioperatively, temperature does play a role keep the temperature on a normal level, fluid oxygenation management and glycemic control. This is apart from antibiotics that can also um, prevent infectious complications. And of course, postoperatively the appropriate management of surgical wounds. And if we give antibiotics, then we should always take into account the give the narrow spectrum of activity of antibiotics that are required for efficacy because each antibiotic has also collateral damages on the microbiome and the broader the antibiotic agent is, the higher is the collateral damage. And in general, antibiotic prophylaxis should only be administered for procedures that are associated with a high risk of infection or where a possible infection has a detrimental effect. For example, in sphincters or prosthesis where infection has a rather detrimental effect. So we do have general risk factors in the patients that are accounted for, but are not uniformly listed in studies that deal with antibiotic prophylaxis. For example, age is a risk factor. The nutritional status is a risk factor, either overweight or underweight, anemia. Immune response deficiency is a risk factor. Comorbidity, such as diabetes mellitus, connective tissue disorders, liver cirrhosis is also a risk factor, or if glucocorticoids, for example, are given. Therefore, it, it is advised to stop glucocorticoids if it is possible. Smoking is a risk factor and bacterial colonization. And if there is a resistance, or we know about resistant pathogens. Now, it is sometimes difficult to diligently account for the risk factors or to um, investigate all these risk factors. And therefore, a general consensus is that the risk for infection increases with a higher ASA score. Um, especially if the score is three and higher. So this has been shown that the risk for perioperative infections increases with a category three, four, five. Now we do have some modalities that have been listed here by the European Centers for Disease Control that needs to be taken into account how we can 
have influence on the antibiotic prophylaxis regimen. For example, there are five modalities that are listed. The multidisciplinary um, that um, there need to be multidisciplinary teams um, that should um, have a consensus and have uh, the task to establish protocols for antibiotic prophylaxis. Then the appropriate timing of, peri of uh, perioperative antibiotic prophylaxis is important and usually, and that is pragmatic, it should be the responsibility of the anesthetist because he sees the patients earlier than the surgeon. And as a general rule, antibiotic prophylaxis should be administered around 60 minutes before the operation. It depends a bit on the antibiotics. Vancomycin, fluoroquinolones um, can be used a little uh, uh, shorter, but in general, it's one hour, roughly one hour, half an hour to one hour. The dosing and duration of a perioperative antibiotic prophylaxis is usually a single dose. Depending on the duration of the procedure and the blood loss, it can be reiterated, so a second antibiotic prophylaxis. And usually the prophylaxis needs to be continued after the end of the surgery. There is no evidence to show that continuous antibiotic prophylaxis is beneficial. Now, the choice of the antibiotic has several principles. On the one hand, we have to take into account the expected bacterial spectrum and the antibiotic resistance. For example, in urology, we have, uh, on the one hand, recent urine culture results. We know, for example, if there is multi-resistant organisms present. History is of uh, note. If the patient has uh, recent antibiotics uh, and antibiotic exposure, so then there is a higher risk for uh, resistant or multi-resistant organism. And if there is evidence of symptomatic infection pre-procedure, for example, if we do a transuricial resection of the prostate and the patient had a catheter and a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. So there are several studies, and I would like to show you one study that really showed how um, the resistance, if we know that, has an impact on the perioperative outcome. For example, this is a study where in transrectal prostate biopsies, all the patients received a fluoroquinolone, regardless of the resistance of the fecal flora. However, the, in the study, they also um, performed rectal swabs. And you see here almost 30% of patients had a fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli in the fecal um, bio, um, in, in the fecal biofilm. Um, and only those patients that had fluoroquinolone resistant pathogens developed infectious complications such as prostatitis, sepsis, or epididymitis. So this shows that a, re, a, flu, a resistant organism does play a role if you don't give the adequate antibiotic. And this was also the instigating point um, where uh, for transrectal prostate biopsy, for example, targeted antibiotic prophylaxis has been developed where culturing of the fecal flora has been taken into account and the antibiotic has given according to the susceptibility results of this fecal flora culturing. And this is shown nicely in uh, meta-analysis that targeted antibiotic prophylaxis giving the antibiotic according to the susceptibility levels is favored and has a lower rate of infectious complications. Another parameter on the choice of the antibiotic is the substance. So the substance itself should not be an antibiotic that is also used for treatment of infection. It should have low side effects, for example, a uh, low um, collateral damage, a low effect on the bowel flora, a low effect um, um, favoring uh, clostridioides, difficile associated diarrhea. Of course, drug allergy has to be taken into account. The efficacy should also be proven in clinical studies, and it should have a suitable pharmacokinetic. And I will again show some examples for that. For example, again, for um, uh, infectious complications after transrectal prostate biopsy, it does matter if we have an antibiotic that crosses the blood pr prostate barrier. And this is similar at the uh, blood brain barrier, a quite tight barrier where not every antibiotic can cross this barrier. Um, there are some 
antibiotics that can cross it better, such as fluoroquinolones and others that do not cross it regularly, such as aminoglycosides, for example. And this, in this, this is highlighted here in this rather role study where a, a fluoroquinolone ciprofloxacin was compared to an aminoglycoside, gentamicin. And as you see on the left side, the patients that received gentamicin had a higher rate of symptomatic or asymptomatic bacteremia. Although on the right side, you see that the pharmacokinetic behaviors are, uh, are extensively different between fluoroquinolones and gentamicin, where fluoroquinolone ciprofloxacin concentrates in the prostate tissue and aminoglycoside does not concentrate. However, this is not readily seen in the clinical studies. Adrian Pilas has uh, done uh, a systematic review on alternative antibiotics, alternative lead to uh, fluoroquinolones if you do transrectal prostate biopsies. And aminoglycosides apparently have also been non-inferior to fluoroquinolones, although if you see the studies, there are very few studies listing only very few patients. So therefore, maybe the studies are also underpowered. I've said pharmacokinetics are important. Unfortunately, there is not many data, not many studies looking in detail into pharmacokinetics of antibiotics with regards to antibiotic prophylaxis. What we know, for example, from this study is that the concentration at wound closure is important. As you see here in this study where gentamicin has been given, the critical concentration at wound closure, if this was below a certain threshold, 1.6 milligrams per liter, the infectious complication rate increased significantly. So at wound closure, we need to have an adequate antibiotic concentrations. And then, of course, patients are also different, different beca uh, um, um, because they have different body weights and different creatinine clearance. And here on the left side in this study, you see how pharmacokinetics are different depending on the body weight, of course, a 90 kilogram patient has a different pharmacokinetic profile compared to 45 kilogram one. And on the right side, if the creatinine clearance is high, the pharmacokinetic profile is different to those where there's renal insufficiency. And therefore, this has also be to be taken into account into the dosing of the antibiotic. And if this is not taken into account, standard here, the time above MIC in this study where a cephalosporin has been used, cefoxetin, um, has only been in the median 50% of the patients right. If you account for body weight and creatinine clearance, so meaning you do a dose escalation, if you have a, a body weight above 80 to 90 kilograms, then you can better have a target. And, in, and if you do that, 100% of the patients had the right target attainment. Um, and therefore, and this is my last slide, we, this is just an example uh, from our clinic, what kind of antibiotic protocol we have, but each clinic should have his own uh, protocol. I would only like to highlight if you use cefuroxim in a patient that has a body weight of 80 kilograms or more, we use a double dose um, and in creatinine clearance um, patients that have renal insufficiency, uh, we do de-escalate the doses. So therefore, these are the sources I used for uh, the presentation. They, of course, the EAU guidelines, you find most of this information in the EAU guidelines. There is an ECDC old technical report, and there's also a very interesting alliance, the Global Alliance for Infection and Surgery, that also um, uh, take care of prophylaxis in surgery in general. Thank you very much for your attention. Good. Thanks. Welcome. A Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very honored, as Florian said before, just to share a few elements about antibiotic prophylaxis in the urological setting. So the title is Antibiotic Prophylaxis in Urological Intervention, the deep question for who, when and where. So it's a very difficult question. And uh, I will show you also my last table about all the antib antibiotic prophylaxis we use in France which is totally different, different from uh, the, the table presented by Florian. So we can share after that, we can share some few discussions. So anyway, uh, 
so as you know, uh, to control the risk of infection after the procedure, there are different elements that you can control and some of them are not controllable. First of all, the skin preparation. The skin preparation, you can, uh, you can uh, prepare the skin uh, as much as better just to control the risk of infection, to reduce the risk of infection, you know that you, you have to, to do a very good uh, skin preparation. You have to do also a good hemostasis because with an hematoma, you will increase the risk of infection after the procedure. Maybe there is a, a kind of chance, you can ask for the chance to reduce the risk of infection. Just uh, do a very good indication because you know uh, if you have a very bad indication, you will increase the risk of complication after the procedure. Just put a drain or not put a drain will increase or decrease the risk of infection. It's difficult to control. The post-op antibiotics, very difficult to know. The learning curve, you know that at the beginning of the, the learning curve, you will increase the risk of infections because of the operative time, but also because of the hemostasis and because of many things. So you have to be uh, framed by an expert at the beginning of the learning curve just to reduce the risk of infection. But please do not think that antibiotic prophylaxis will reduce by itself the risk of infections. Alone, it won't, it won't, uh, it's, not, it's not enough. Uh, antibiotic prophylaxis we use for, uh, for decades and we still have a few infections after the procedure. So let's talk about the history because uh, as you know, when we speak about the history, it's very easy to know the future. Uh, in uh, 2005, the EAU uh, asked for antibiotic prophylaxis for every procedure in urology, uh, from partial nephrectomy to radical prostatectomy, but also for the cystoscopy. Uh, and we uh, know now that uh, for cystoscopy, antibiotic prophylaxis is not useful. But they asked to, uh, to give some fluoroquinolone and different association of second generation cephalosporin for every procedure. But uh, as the literature changed, it was very easy for the 2014 EAU guidelines to give you a different a way of having this uh, antibiotic prophylaxis before urology procedure. And they ask us to stop any antibiotics before uh, cystoscopy. And for prostate biopsy, uh, uh, I know that uh, Florian uh, gave this talk before about fluoroquinolone or trimetoprim, sulfomethoxazole or metronidazole. It has changed now. For radical prostatectomy, the association of trimetoprim or sulfomethoxazole a uh, second generation or third generation cephalosporine, none for ureteroscopy, and some association also for partial nephrectomy, and for TURP or TURB, some association as well. But the sentence was quite clear. No antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for clean operation, whereas a single or one-day dose is recommended in clean contaminated, meaning that uh, it was the Altemeyer classification that was used for these uh, guidelines. And we know now that this Altemeyer classification is not so good for urology. For example, the simple prostatectomy, maybe you still uh, use this, uh, this uh, very old procedure, uh, but for the, sim uh, the simple prostatectomy for BPH, you know that uh, the risk of infection is between five to 10% after the procedure. It's a, uh, it's a clean contaminated uh, procedure, uh, a type to uh, Altemeyer classification. And for the radical prostatectomy, it's the same. It's a, a class two. Uh, and the class two uh, for the radical prostatectomy, after the procedure, we have less than 2% infection risk. So meaning that there are two different uh, procedures in the same classification. So Altemeyer classification is not so good, especially in urology. We know that. In 2022, uh, the, the future evolved and uh, now the, 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 the guidelines are totally different from the 20 or five guidelines. For example, for cystoscopy, nothing. For radical prostatectomy, the sentence is clear. Too weak to allow the panel to make recommendation either for or against antibiotic prophylaxis. Meaning that there is no element for and no element against in the literature. 
but we know now, and Florian uh, told you before, that we have the problem of the resistance, meaning that if you know that the resistance is due to the consumption, we have to decrease the consumption. So there is an element against antibiotic prophylaxis in the radical prostatectomy setting. And maybe it's the same for the partial nephrectomy. What about ureteroscopy? Ureteroscopy in the guidelines, in the last guidelines of this very good group of, with all of my friends, trimetoprim or the second generation cephalosporine or the third generation or the association of this beta-lactamase inhibitor and the amoxicillin. And the same for TURP and uh, TURB with this sentence, if I risk saying that in the literature, when the risk is very low, maybe uh, you can decrease the antibiotic prophylaxis use uh, for TURB, for example, for very, for very small tumors. So it's very difficult. We have to, uh, to analyze all the literature and the recent ones uh, to say uh, the new guidelines. The new guidelines is from the French guidelines. And uh, as Florian told you, we have to, we had to, uh, to work with uh, the anesthesiologist group, the SFAR, and we did this uh, great method uh, to do a very uh, brand new uh, guidelines, the French one. Anyway, it can be useful in every Europe country. These are the, uh, the, the, the grade uh, table and the soft, uh, the soft table we had for every procedure. So uh, more than 10,000 uh, patients are included in all this uh, uh, intervention in urology. Uh, but uh, as you know, the literature is poor. That's why the guidelines change uh, every, every two or three years. And the soft tables are very difficult to understand. But uh, if you want to share with me, just send me an email. I will, I will give you all the soft tables. Just uh, to tell you the conclusions. The conclusions are very clear. When you analyze the literature, there is no way to use any antibiotic for cystoscopy. So we have to decrease this antibiotic use. Uh, I know that some people uh, in France as well that are use uh, antibiotics for cystoscopy, uh, we have especially to stop this, uh, this uh, use in this uh, setting. For prostate biopsy, uh, the, we have to change all the guidelines, but uh, also there is also the the approach, which is different now with the transperineal that can be uh, used without any antibiotic prophylaxis. For the radical prostatectomy, we decided for decades now in France to stop any antibiotics in this setting. And uh, now it's quite clear in the guidelines, do not use any antibiotic before the radical prostatectomy and after the radical prostatectomy as well. For ureteroscopy, just uh, use the, the first generation or the second generation cephalosporin, because if you use the third generation cephalosporin, you will increase the beta-lactamase, uh, meaning that uh, you will increase much more the resistance with the third generation cephalosporin than with, with the first generation cephalosporin. Just, just decrease uh, the selection pressure, uh, just to decrease the resistance. For partial nephrectomy, nothing, no antibiotics. Even if you open uh, the, uh, the upper upper uh, area with uh, urine uh, outside uh, the, the, the kidney, anyway, with partial nephrectomy, a small one or a big one, ju just do not use any antibiotic prophylaxis. For TURP, just uh, the first or second generation cephalosporine, uh, mandatory, and for the two URP, uh, for the bladder cancers, very small tumor or big tumor, just do not use any antibiotic prophylaxis because the literature is uh, quite poor, but for very uh, small tumors, uh, it's no, now that uh, if you use antibiotics, you won't decrease any uh, risk of infections. And maybe it's the same for big tumors, but it's not sure. But uh, with this, the problem of the consumption and the resistance, we just have to decrease the use of antibiotics. So we conducted uh, uh, the first study about uh, radical prostatectomy, which is the PROSTUC study uh, with uh, 1,000 uh, men uh, with this uh, procedure. Uh, 
and uh, it's not published, but uh, we're still doing the, the statistics. I just can give you a few elements. There is uh, no link between uh, antibiotic prophylaxis and the risk of uh, infection after the procedure. And furthermore, there is no link between the urine culture before the radical prostatectomy, positive or negative, and the risk of having an infection after the procedure. And it's a totally a, a change of paradigm. And we have to change totally the paradigm. And that's the same for the partial nephrectomy. We conducted this nephrobac study. I will give you also the, the same conclusion, no link between the, uh, the, the, the urine culture before the procedure and no link uh, between the uh, antibiotic prophylaxis use and the risk of infection after the procedure. So, but many questions are remaining. When to perform a pre -up, uh, urine culture? Uh, before TURP, it's proven. Just, just do use this uh, pre op urine culture. It has been to, to be uh, uh, negative before TURP. Uh, before ureteroscopy, it's proven. But before radical prostatectomy, we don't know. Before uh, partial nephrectomy. Ju so just stop using this urine culture. Because if it's positive, if you, want to do, if you don't want to treat this uh, urine culture positive, the GP will do that. So it will increase the risk of uh, resistance, and, and sometimes it will increase the risk of infection. Yes, I told you, if you use uh, this antibiotic prophylaxis, you will increase the risk of infection. And it's a new paradigm. We have to change the attitude. Which attitude in case of positive urine culture? Do we have to treat before, two days before, three days before, after? We don't know. We have to do more, more studies about that. Which attitude in case of multi-resistant bacteria? And Florian asked us the question before. What about antibiotic prophylaxis? If you use pre-op antibiotics in case of pre-op urine culture, do you have to add uh, antibiotic prophylaxis during the procedure? We don't know. Which attitude in case of polymicrobial urine culture, which, which is really a very la, uh, large question, and we are still uh, we're just beginning a, a study in France about polymicrobial urine culture before BPH treatment. When to extend antibiotic prophylaxis after the procedure? I just want to tell you never, but it has to be proven before. And which attitude in increased risk, immoderate depression, Catheters, previous infection, we don't know. So just uh, decrease uh, the, the use of antibiotic when, when it's not necessary, especially in this uh, radical prostatectomy or partial nephrectomy. So in conclusion, it's my last slide. Antibiotic prophylaxis can't reduce the risk of, inf of infection by itself. And sometimes it can increase the risk of infection. So, so just do uh, reduce the consumption, of, the consumption of antibiotics, and especially in this antibiotic prophylaxis setting, and especially in before radical prostatectomy or before partial nephrectomy, just stop using uh, antibiotics. So more studies are needed, but uh, we know a, a very good uh, study now that if you use antibiotics, you will increase the resistance, it's well known, so just decrease the, uh, the consumption of antibiotics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Prier. We're going to move on to our next talk by Prof. Bashkar uh, Somani from Southampton. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Zafar. It's my pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, something which is very close to my heart. Thanks to ISO and to European School of Urology. I'll give you a perspective in endourology and uh, if there is a way and what is the way to reduce antibiotics. Let's talk about urological infections and in connection to kidney stones. We know that uh, bacteria forms a mitis for crystal aggregation and subsequent stone formation. And that is then linked to bacterial adhesion and crystals. And then you have stones that form. So there is, seems to be a link between stones and bacteria. So let's look at if there is a true link. So this is a, a follow-up of 19 years of patients uh, with and without kidney stones. And patients who had kidney stones over a period of 19 years were at a higher risk of uh, urinary infections. So we think it's not just theoretical. There is a clinical association. 
between kidney stones and the risk of having UTIs. What about PCNLs? You know, we, that is probably one of the most invasive procedures we do. You can see that the risk of fever, UTI, sepsis is all not in the normal range. It's more than what you would expect compared to the other complications. So even sepsis is almost uh, one in 200. So there's a real risk with sepsis and we need to know who can we avoid and what are the ways of minimizing antibiotic use. What about ureteroscopy and urosepsis after ureteroscopy? This is the a study we looked at uh, all uh, systematic review with all uh, papers, more than 400 patients re reporting primarily on infectious complications with nearly 25,000 patients and look at the complications and risk factors. Overall complications are almost 8% and half of which were infectious complications. What are the risk factors then? The risk factors are, as we have heard already, gender, age, high BMI, and in, in the urology stone size and stone burden, history of previous infections or positive culture, tent dwell time, quite important for endo urology, and any history of previous indwelling catheter or neurogenic bladder. What about intraoperative factors? Procedural time seems to be quite important and the use of stents. And postoperatively, you need to identify the sepsis early to get a better outcome and early stent removal. So now we know how we can minimize it. Let's see what we can do in real time. Sometimes patient factors are non-modifiable, but antibiotic prophylaxis, generally the recommendation is a single dose perioperatively. Treatment of any pre-existing UTI, local antibiotic resistance patterns, quite important, and I'll show you what we do in Southampton. Keeping the procedural time low and keeping indwelling stents and the stent dwell time low. Access sheet for ureteroscopy seems to be preventive because uh, it kind of reduces intraurinal pressure and there seems to be a link with intraurinal pressure and, and infections. So let's look at operative time specifically. What is the operative time? That is the key. We have looked at operative time uh, in this uh, large systematic review of over 30,000 patients. And it seems that 90 minutes, although in my personal practice, I try and keep it below an hour, but 90 minutes seems to be the cutoff after which infectious complications really go, go, go higher. What about stent dwell time? I was just talking to you about stent dwell time. Two months seems to be the cutoff after which, so if you have somebody with a stent and you're planning a, a ureteroscopy, uh, they've had a primary stent, after two months, the infectious complications are higher. And after four months, they're significantly higher. And in fact, the number needed to harm at four months is 10. So one in 10 patients probably will come to harm from infectious complications after four months. What about looking at death from kidney stone disease? Is it really a thing? You know, with PCNL ureteroscopy, you, it is really a thing. And in fact, of the overall mortality, sepsis seems to be the bigger contributor. And when we look at who, who gets, who are the most at risk, these are patients with high comorbidities, spinal cord injury, stone burden, neurogenic patients. And how do you prevent this? Most of them actually are targeted towards sepsis, reducing operative time, intraurinal pressure, treatment of UTIs, prophylactic antibiotics, and avoiding multiple tracts. What about uh, ureteroscopy then? Is, that, is death a thing with ureteroscopy? Again, we've looked at 72 deaths, and sepsis seems to be the primary of the reported causes. And again, how do you prevent death or sepsis-related deaths in ureteroscopy? Patient selection seems to be important, pre-op assessment, monitoring of sepsis, antibiotic guidelines following it, and staging the procedure if it's really big rather than going forever. Uh, as I said, operative time is important. Use of access sheets and keeping the intraurinal pressure low or as low as possible. And again, it links to sepsis and operative time. Let's look at whether there is any clever way of finding it out. So we looked at this uh, nine European center study looking at machine learning model to predict post-op urosepsis. And these are patients which needed ICU admission. We had group A where they were admitted to the ICU and group B, which had without sepsis, a matched cohort and a total of 114 patients. And machine learning model predicted sepsis in 82% of cases. And those that did not have sepsis, again, looking at the parameters, 80% of controls is predicted. So I think overall, it was a good discrimination. And I think what is the future? We think that you'll have algorithms and actually you can have a, a system where you feed in the data and that can tell you whether or not the risk of sepsis is there and what is the risk of sepsis, which also helps patient counseling. Let's look at the guidelines then. Urine culture, absolutely. We have already heard or perform microscopy. Uh, 
exclude infections prior to stone removal and offer periop antibiotics. What about uh, AUA guidelines? Again, there is no benefit to extended antibiotics after ureteroscopy. And that, is, that comes down to antibiotic stewardship. We don't want to give any extra, and we have just heard two or three excellent talks about the same thing. Do not give extra antibiotics because it makes you feel better. It doesn't actually change the, the patient outcome. And actually, it might, in fact, increase the resistance of patients. Now, this is what we do. Every five years, we look at our own antibiotic trends of resistance with E. coli and other bacteria. So this is, we are now into the third cycle. This was the second cycle. And you look at all the trends, and actually we periodically change our antibiotic guideline for the local region based on this. And uh, we modify both for prophylaxis and treatment. And I think this is something every region, every hospital should be doing. They need to know, you need to know your own antibiotic resistance patterns to actually follow the, uh, whatever is best in your area. And of course, adhering to the guidelines. What about uh, ureteroscopy in terms of recurrent UTIs? This is just out of interest. If patients have recurrent UTIs, sometimes offering them ureteroscopy and treating them, as you can see, for up to two years, the infection-free rates are much lower compared to controls. So you might have patient cohort with infections and treating them will make them or much more likely to make them infection-free. What about antibiotic prevention for lithotripsy? Uh, or how do you go about that? Well, I mean, this is universally accepted. You do not need it for low or no risk patients with lithotripsy. And in fact, we stopped doing this about 10 years ago. We do not give any antibiotic prophylaxis for lithotripsy patients. So how do we conclude then? You know, do we know? Are we any wiser? I think it's absolutely fundamental to know your local antibiotic resistance patterns. What is happening in your region? Because some antibiotic which is used in, elsewhere may not be the same as in your area. Ensure, for, especially for end urology procedures, you have a negative urine culture. Routine lithotripsy doesn't need any prophylaxis. For PCNL and ureteroscopy, periop antibiotic, for us, single dose is enough. And there is no routine rule for extended antibiotics. Beware of sepsis in high-risk patients or complex stones. In these cases, you have to individualize the treatment and maybe discuss with the microbiologist if need be. And I do think that the future with artificial intelligence would be much more helpful in managing these complex situations and these algorithms will help us predict not just the risk of sepsis, et cetera, but also how to prevent them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Somani. Excellent lecture. And we're moving on to our final lecture by Professor Beckland Johansson. Thank you, Safar, for inviting me to try and outline future directions and clinical trials on antibiotic prophylaxis in urology. I have no conflicts of interest uh, related to this uh, presentation. I will start with some background information. And we know from uh, the early days of prostate biopsy, when we did RCTs on whether to whether or not to use antibiotics, that the infection rate after uh, non-antibiotic prophylaxis went up to as high as 70% bacteremia and 36% bacteriuria. And we know from studies with antibiotic prophylaxis that the infection rate after urodynamic studies is as high as 45%. And the infection rate after TUMT in some studies is as high as 30%. After penile prosthesis implant, it goes up to almost 23%. After percutaneous nephrolithotomy, up to 14%. After radical nephrectomy, up to 2%. After RALP, 5.6%, and after radical cystectomy, almost up to 20%. If you look into registry data, we know from many years of the GPIU studies that the average prevalence is about 10%. There is a big variation in the prevalence, and there is also a big variation in the definitions of UTIs and the observation time that has been used in these studies. If we turn to RALP, 
and look for RCTs. To my knowledge, there are none. If we look for systematic reviews related to antibiotic prophylaxis in RALP, to my knowledge, there is one ongoing study performed by Eva Falkensammer, which shows that the mean rates of UTI is about 5% with antibiotic prophylaxis, but there are inconsistent definitions of infectious complications and follow-up periods, and there are poor reporting of side effects of antibiotic prophylaxis. There are similarities between antibiotic prophylaxis and empirical treatment of urinary tract infections. When prophylaxis and empirical treatment are administered, we don't know the identity and the susceptibility profile of the causative pathogen. However, as you can see in the diagram to the right, this can be predicted based on local resistance rates, procedure and patient-specific risk factors, and mathematical modeling. And the more local data and the more advanced mathematics the higher clinical relevance can be obtained, and the higher is the likelihood that we can predict which pathogen will cause infections. Coming to future directions, we need to define some navigation points. And from my description of the background, we know that we do need infection protective measures in urological surgery. And as uh, both Florian and Frank alluded to, we need more knowledge about risk factors who, that can be eliminated. And we know from the O'Neill report in UK back in 2016 that we must adhere to antibiotic stewardship principles. Many of you are familiar with the global prevalence study on infections in urology, which was a big altruistic project uh, aiming to generate evidence to improve practice. This study had benefits for investigators, uh, such as authorship, acknowledgements, access to data and slide decks, taking part in international research association and making new friends. And there were all benefits for departments also, such as quality assurement, assurance and scientific merit. In the upper photo to the right, you can see that in 2018, the study was running in more than 120 countries. And at that time, we had screened 30,000 patients. If you look at the tables on the lower right, this is just to give you an example of the publication capacity of the members in this research group. Despite of this, we decided to replace the GPIU with a new study called the Deep Euro. And this was... Uh, outlined in a paper in the recent issue of European Urology Today. But the reasons were that we had problems to obtain ethical approval in many countries. We had poor national representation and we faced difficulties to get papers published in high impact journals and to inform guidelines. The reasons were that we always used a retrospective design, that we had random inclusion of study centers, and poor documentation of how investigators had been trained to register patients. No, we intend to make things different. We would like to address ethical issues up front. We will engage national coordinators. We will give studies a prospective design and use dedicated elite centers, and we will prepare instruction videos for investigators. The Deep Euro, is uh, an activity inside the ESIU, which is uh, chaired by today's chairman, Professor Tan Dogdu. And uh, the daily administration of this study will be taken care of by a dedicated research group chaired by Bella Kovas in, in Budapest, who is also a master of business, uh, of business and administration. And we already engaged a research assistant whose name is Eva Falkensammer. And to the right, you can see that we already have engaged or defined chief national investigators. Um, the study has got a database administrator and a research fellow, as I just mentioned. So the workforce is a group of, cent is a central coordinating committee, national coordinators and local investigators. And the success 
of the study will depend on the friendly collaboration with these three parts of the workforce. And we already defined the first index procedure, which is RALP. And you can see that there are other procedures in the pipeline. The principle of this study is that we will start with a cohort study where we, it's, it's, it's like a registry, where we will define and address all the risk factors that Florian and Frank talked about. We will define antimicrobial resistance and we will use ECRFs that contain all relevant risk factors. And we will use 30 day follow up. And once we have the basic data and the index procedure is defined, we will sophisticatedly, sophisticatedly define clusters and run randomized controlled trials to um, try and uh, address the chance of de-escalation of antibiotic prophylaxis and maybe reach French conditions all over Europe. And what we hope is that one day the deep euro study will enable urologists to develop a personal antibiotic prophylaxis calculator. And to reach this aim, we need dedicated investigators from strong urology centers to help us provide high level evidence to support publication in high impact journals and inform urological guidelines. So, Mr. Chairman, my answer to your question, to your deep question related to the future is to join the deep Euro study. And we need investigators who understand the trifecta of antimicrobial stewardship, which can be summarized as no infections, no resistance, and as little use of antibiotics as possible. We hope that the study will start in January 24. And for those who are interested, I invite you to take contact with Eva Falkensammer, whose mail address and photo you can see at the bottom of this slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Berklund and uh, all speakers. I think this was a very um, insightful group of speakers. And something I picked up on this last talk is about a trifecta. We're familiar with these terms, pentafectors, trifectors, as, as we all know from other subspecialties. But now here's a new triangle. We don't want antibiotics. We don't want resistance and we don't want infections. That's that's a renaissance for us. And a few things I heard here yeah, I want to address before moving on to the questions is that a, a short, a common pattern I heard both from Frank, Professor uh, Breer, and from Professor Bashkar Somani is that operation time fundamentally affects the risk of surgery. I think this was alluded by Professor Wagenlehner also. Now, this reminds me of a story I read about a famous surgeon at the time in the 19th century, Robert Liston. Robert Liston was quite famous in being the fast, holding the fastest knife in the west of London. He, would, he was famous to do an amputation in two and a half minutes. Pre-anesthetic pre times, of course, forced surgeons to be master of their craft. As surgeons, it still remains as a craft and we're trying to bring in science to this and we're trying to generate the evidence. And all evidence indicates from the, today's talk, reflecting back on the trifecta, we want less antibiotics, we want less infections, and we want less resistance. So without any further ado, there's a few questions within our remaining five to six minutes of our time. First question, I think, will go to Professor Breuer. Are you online? Yes, I am. Lovely. Are you available to open your uh, video for us? No, I'm not. A, no, it's not. It's impossible. Okay. I asked Anna for that, but it's... Uh... That's fine. So you have raised a controversial topic here. You've said that we're going ahead with some radical surgeries without giving any antibiotic prophylaxis. That includes radical prostatectomies. That includes partial nephrectomies. 
Is this yeah. your practice or is this your recommendation? No, it is a practice for maybe 12 to 13 uh, years now in France. So it will be very interesting to share our tables in this deep rural uh, uh, paper uh, or uh, statistics just to compare uh, our practice for a decade and maybe Florian and your practice as well to see if, uh, I mean, it's multifactorial in infection. It's not only antibiotics. So we have to share a very big uh, data uh, set all together. I see. And is this because you have uh, very fast surgeons or is it because <laughs> you have very clear infection prevention protocols? No, uh, first we have to be sure that our infection uh, rate after the procedure is less than your. I'm not sure of that because we uh, we missed many uh, many people with infection that are that are going to the other department. So mm -hmm. we need prospective study to be sure of the rate of infection after the procedure. That's why the literature is poor. We need prospective study to be sure. Okay, and that obviously, hopefully, will be addressed by the deep euro first stage yeah. study. Hopefully, yeah. Now, uh, taking that further ahead and uh, addressing a few questions from our audience today, there's been a question on the principles, which I will I will um, hope both Professor Somani and Professor Wagenlehner will be able to uh, address. There's been this concept about when we're doing endourological procedures. If you violate the mucosa, you should give antibiotics. And if you don't, you can go stay away from antibiotics. A few of our audiences have posed this question. Um, how would you comment on that? Florian, do you want to go first or do you want me to? Okay, then I go first. I think this was this is the description for asymptomatic bacteria when you would like to start with an antibiotic in in a patient that has an intervention the breakage of the of the mucosa however in endourology we also know that if you increase the pressure which is uh, one of the cornerstones then you can also induce a bacteremia and uh, on the other side we have now studies and meta-analysis for example for uh, ureterinoscopy, but also nef um, percutaneous nephrolithotomy. If you uh, decrease the pressure uh, continuously under a certain under a certain uh, level, then you have less infection. So therefore, this is just an umbrella um, uh, picture, and uh, it, it it can be used for guidelines, but it, it it's not necessarily uh, capturing all the. Um, all the parameters we have uh, on the, all the patients we have in our uh, in our ambulatorium, for example. Uh, I mean, Zafar, I think the problem is you don't want to give too much. And if you give too little or if you don't give any, you can end up with sepsis. And there's a balance. You want them to be safe, but you don't want to give them so much. So for us, the, the way we do it is we always look at our own guidelines and antibiotic resistance patterns. And our guidelines are based on that. We give them a single perioperative antibiotic uh, dose, ensuring that the preop given is culture. And routinely, we don't give any uh, you know, antibiotics unless there is a specific situation. So somebody has asked him, what about stag on the eating culture? Cannot be made negative. In those cases specifically, we have a policy where we do a multidisciplinary meeting. And in those cases specifically, we might give them three days before, cover them during, and maybe a few days after. But specifically in cases with large stone, big stone burden, you know that there will be, you know, there will be risk of sepsis there. Then you will do that. But routinely, I would say for 95% of patients, a single palliative operative dose for both ureteroscopy PCNL is enough. And for lithotripsy, we don't give anything. Excellent. So clearly not an easy answer to that question, a big question. Which brings me on to my uh, final point. Since it's so complex to make these decisions, I think a number of us have highlighted about artificial intelligence. Now I know this is this is quite a big topic. Everyone is a bit scared what might happen or are very excited with what might happen. You've got two ends of the spectrum. 
Now, instead of calling it AI, let's call it advanced analytics for today's discussion. Is that going to essentially help us put all these complex risk factors together? Bashkar, you mentioned it initially. And then I would like to see the thoughts of Florian and then Professor Beckland Johansson on this topic. So, Zaf, we are doing a lot of work on AI with outcome prediction modeling, also to look at uh, different aspects of both infections and stone disease. I don't think it will be a panacea that will just be, you know, we don't have a, a foolproof answer because these models are based on the data you feed, the test data, and then you have to test it to make it better. But the way it works is the more data you feed, the better it gets in predicting it. So overall, with time, they will get, and that's why it's intelligent, you know, it will get better and better. So previously, we used to rely on things like, you know, a set database, and that was what we based on. But this AI tools keep evolving. So I do think personally that we will be using it in a lot of different aspects of both infection prevention and, and, and guidelines in time to come. It's inevitable to avoid an AI discussion nowadays. So based on your description, Florian, do you see that uh, we can one day get there? We have we can be lazy, sit back and let AI do things for us? Well, I think it will help individualize our, uh, our uh, therapeutic approaches because we feed more, uh, more data into the system and we get a more, a more precision um, and a more personalized uh, statement about the patient we have in front of us. It will not uh, substitute our decisions, but it will probably make them more precise. That would be my prediction. Which brings us to the next point that you, you both said that we need good data. Professor Berglund, what do you think about that? Can't hear you, sorry. I, I, I agree that we need better data. And I personally foresee uh, a, a shift from procedure-specific prophylaxis to patient-specific prophylaxis. But we've, before we can do that, we need to know more about risk factors. And that includes geography. It includes seasons. So I believe we will end up with a, a lot of detailed information, which should preferably be hand, handled by machines. So my answer is yes. I do believe there is a role for artificial intelligence, and I do believe one day we will use we will have new protocols, personalized prophylaxis. And uh, Frank, uh, your data you collected for the both the radical prostatectomies and partial nephrectomies, I know it's a phase of being analyzed now. Um, do you see the future going into decision supportive tools with the data you collected? Uh, unfortunately, these uh, data are retrospective for 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 the prostate and the prospective for the for the partial nephrectomy. So, as I said before, we do need a prospective analysis because infection is quite rare after this kind of procedure. And if you if you miss just one case, it will uh, change all the statistics. So we have to do to have a very good data. And my data is the beginning of good data, but it's not so good. Lovely, lovely. Um, thank you, everyone. I would like to conclude this session. And it was uh, very nice to see you all and uh, spare your time on this summer evening. Um, and I would like to say that, who was it? I think it was uh, Bashkar. Please don't use antibiotics as anxiolytics because it's not going to change the outcome, apart from the surgeon feeling a bit better that day. Enjoy the rest of the evening, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.